As you come there, if you'd like to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, if you're new to the Bible, towards the end there's a list of books that start with first names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the four Gospels, four testimonies about Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6 this morning. And if you haven't been here, just to kind of catch you up, we, we are in a series, a week-by-week week series in the book of Acts. We've been doing that in the fall, and we're going to continue that when the new year rolls around. But we decided to take a, a brief break uh, heading into the Christmas season and to study the topic of the grace of God in greater detail. We had a message in Acts that talked about that, and we wanted to look specifically at some some aspects of our lives where the grace of God has to be applied. It has to be uh, sunk down deeply into our souls. And so we've done that with a number of different topics. And this morning, uh, we're going to conclude that mini-series. And the last message, we didn't want to end the series without talking about the topic of grace and relationships. So we talked about grace and how we read the scriptures, especially the Old Testament. We talked about grace and our relationship with God. We talked about grace and our obedience. And this morning, grace and our relationship to others. What impact must the grace of God have on how we relate to one another? It's a very important part of what it means to really understand God's grace, is knowing how that should transform our lives towards one another. That's what we're going to do this morning. Well, in the mid-1500s, there was a Christian named Dirk Willem. Dirk Willem decided, contrary to the popular religious belief in his day, that it was right for him to be baptized as a Christian, that his infant baptism was not his own personal expression of faith, and so he decided to be baptized. Well, So severe was the persecution against that act in that time that the people of the town, the officials and so forth, arrested him and put him in prison. Well, he escaped prison and was running away, was fleeing the officers and the magistrates and so forth of the town. Well, they were chasing him and he made his way to a a lake or a river that was just lightly covered over with ice and he risked racing across it. Well, he made it, but... The officer that was chasing him did not. He broke through the ice. This officer plunged into the icy water and began to call for help. Now, at that moment, what difference does the grace of God make? Your enemy, literally seeking your life, is calling for help, is in danger. What difference does the grace of God make in that moment or in a thousand moments, perhaps less extreme, but similar in that we feel the pain and the cost and the sacrifice of them? We feel the abnormality of what's being asked at that moment. We feel the countercultural nature of this moment. It must be normal in our culture. For this man, he's he's running for his life. He could easily view this as a, a providence of God, that God is protecting and preserving him. But for Dirk Willem, it made all the difference. He turned, lifted his enemy out of the water. The magistrate from the shore demanded that the officer still take him into custody, which he did. And later, Dirk Willem was burned at the stake, both for his confession of belief in Jesus through baptism and for his decision to give his life for his enemy. It's a, it's a shocking decision. It's a shocking moment in this man's life. It's so shocking. That kind of grace towards an enemy is so shocking, it can only serve to remind us of the ultimate shocking example of a person loving their enemy even to death, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what it's supposed to do. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. That's the effect that the lives of Christians should always have. Dirk is not that much of an exception to what he was called to, though he was exceptional in how he applied it. 
Every Christian is called to show in their relationships the grace that they have received. The shocking grace of God displayed in the coming of the Son of God to live in the place of sinners, to die for you and me on a cross, to love his enemies even to death, and to raise them up to life. That shocking kind of grace is meant to be seen. There should be glimmers of it seen in the life of every Christian as they relate to others. That kind of shocking grace is meant to be reflected in our relationships. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making in his sermon, which we find in Luke chapter 6. It is shocking language. Jesus intends it to shock us, to wake us up out of our normal, reasonable way of thinking about relationships. And if you listen closely to his words, you'll see most importantly that they are a self-portrait of himself. Let's read Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 27. This is Jesus speaking. He says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The Lord bless the preaching of his word. I think you could summarize that paragraph and a number of other passages in the scriptures that are similar to it by saying that the shocking grace of God to us is meant, is meant and must be seen in the grace we give to others. We must give the same kind of shocking grace we receive. Now, obviously, we don't give saving grace. We don't give atoning grace. But what I mean is our demeanor, our our attitude, our actions towards others should reflect the same level of shocking grace that is given to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how grace changes a relationship with another person. It it presses it out of the reasonable exchange of goods that is normal in this fallen world and presses it towards an otherworldly display of shocking mercy and grace that we ultimately see in the coming of Jesus Christ to save us. Now, there's three marks about this grace that I want to pull out of this passage, okay? Three marks of the kind of grace that we're to give to others from these words of Jesus. First of all, it is sacrificial. It is sacrificial. Look down there what Jesus says in the opening paragraph. But I say to you, 
Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. Then he goes on to talk about this metaphor. If, if someone strikes you on the cheek, what's the natural impulse? The natural fallen impulse is to either strike back to see if you can retaliate, injure them in kind. And Jesus says, no, that is a normal impulse. Instead, turn the other cheek to them. Extend relationship to them again. It's shocking language. Jesus intends it to be shocking. You can almost feel the the quiet of the crowd. Whispers, did he really just say that? Love who? My enemy? Do what when they curse me? Bless them. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do good? Do good to those who have harmed me? And what's this whole passage about verse 30? Give to everyone who begs from you. So if if someone is this demanding, insisting, "I, I want something from you, don't be stingy in the way you give to them. And actually, if they take something from you, don't count that as a mark against them. Look for what else you can provide in addition to what they have taken. Now, now there's, there's certainly a level of hyperbole here. Jesus isn't saying that in any moment we're just to be walking around clothesless Christians. Uh, no, that's not the goal here. The, the point is this disposition to give beyond, to return good for evil, to to love even our enemies, to pray and bless even those that that would curse us. It says, as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. How sacrificial would you like someone to be to you? That's the standard of how sacrificial you should be to them. It's, It's shocking language. The point is, sacrificial grace towards others is intended to display the same kind of sacrificial grace we've received. Here's why I think that's the case. If you read this as a self-portrait, it is startlingly, startlingly accurate. Think about these verses as just descriptions of Jesus. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Who's he talking about? Who ultimately loved his enemies? It's it's the one speaking. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Who did more good than Jesus Christ dying to pay for those that hated him? Who better than Jesus reveals what it means to bless those who curse you and to pray for those who abuse you? In a very short time, Jesus will be praying literally from the cross for those who nailed him there. Who more than Jesus understands what it means to give even more than is taken? So they take his dignity and his, his, even his dignity as, as a man on the cross and then he gives his life to save them. This is a, a, a portrait of Jesus Christ. And the shocking grace that he displayed in saving you and me and every Christian. So what does the grace look like when it's displayed towards others? Well, according to Jesus, it should look sacrificial. It should look painful. It should look extraordinary. It should not look like the normal kinds of things that people do in this fallen world. Now, a quick aside here. There is no justification in this passage for remaining silent and failing to take action when a person we know is being abused or wounded. This is, this is not a passage justifying passivism when we're seeing people that are victims of sinful, evil action. We should jump to defend them, certainly. Certainly doesn't eliminate the role of government to punish wrongdoers, nor the role of the church to demand that those who claim to be Christians not act in any such harmful way toward others. It doesn't eliminate any of those things. It's talking about in our personal relationships. 
It's important to make those caveats, I think, especially to women, that this passage is not claiming that you allow any amount of evil to continue to be done without seeking help and protection as you should. So it's, it's not speaking to that. It's talking, if we can move that kind of situation to the side and just allow it to speak to us in our personal relationships with others and let it land on us with the full weight of the kind of shocking grace we're to display towards those who seek to harm us. We, we can tend to think that it's sort of our right to resist those who would treat us unkindly and ungraciously. One author, G.B. Caird, says, he who retaliates thinks that he is manfully resisting aggression. In fact, he is making an unconditional surrender to evil. This is the standard of the Christian, this kind of sacrificial grace that is willing to be injured by the sins of others because they are aware that the one who was injured in our place lives inside of us by his spirit. And in displaying that kind of sacrificial grace, we are showing him to the world. One writer, Philip Riken. I would recommend his book, Loving the Way Jesus Loves. I've read some of it, and as usual, my wife, I think, has read all of it. Uh, but I'd recommend the book, and he says this, The real issue for most of us is that we always want to place limits on our love. We are ready to give, but only when we have something left over. We are willing to care as long as it isn't too inconvenient. We are able to love, provided that people love us back. What Jesus is saying is there is a kind of shocking grace that has saved us and that same shocking grace should be displayed in sacrificial service to those who do us harm. That is the grace that reveals the gospel. Be like your Savior, this passage says. Sacrifice like your Savior. Give sacrificial grace to those who ought to be punished. Those who seem to set themselves against us, we are to love them. Those that hate us, we are to find some way of improving their life by doing them good. Those that curse us should hear our blessing. The shock of this passage, it, it, it intends to wake us up from commonplace, reasonable love that is normal in a fallen world. We are not called to normal, reasonable love. We are called to cross-shaped love that is sacrificial toward those who ought to be punished. And the Savior keeps going. He keeps building on this theme. Second mark of this grace we're to extend to others is that it is one-sided. It's sacrificial, and it's also one-sided. Jesus asks a number of rhetorical questions in verse 32 and following. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive... What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. In this paragraph, Jesus is just building on his definition of shocking grace. He's saying, look, it, it is sacrificial, it's painful, and let's just get it out there right in front of us. It's going to be one-sided. And he uses these rhetorical questions, and the whole point is, look, you should want the benefit of looking like your Savior. Because that's what marks you as a Christian. That's what marks me as a Christian. What benefit is it? In other words, what, what, what distinguishes you if you love in precisely the same kind of way that any normal pagan would love? He said, look, no, normal pagans love those that they know will love them back. They give to those when they know they're going to get it all back. That's, that's normal. That's not extraordinary. That's not Christian. There's nothing wrong with loving those who will also love you back. The point Jesus is making is there's nothing distinctively Christian about that. 
And surely, surely, you would want the benefit of being distinctively set apart to your Savior, who is the ultimate example of someone who loved in a one-sided way. It's one-sided. See, there's, there's nothing particularly unique or supernatural about giving when you expect to receive. What is unique is giving when you know you will get nothing back. Is loving when you know they will not love you back. When you have no reasonable expectation of getting anything in return. That is unique grace. That is otherworldly affection. That is a supernatural kind of grace. That's what Jesus calls his followers to. And notice he says, here, here's the benefit Here's the benefit. Your reward will be great. If I can say it this way, it seems as though Jesus is saying, look, heavenly rewards are are not based on people doing things that every fallen sinner would do. They're, They're based on people doing things that reveal a supernatural life planted inside of somebody. God is looking for his own character to celebrate in heavenly rewards. He's not looking for commonplace give and take commercialism. He's looking for supernatural give and don't get love. It is one-sided. Your reward will be great. And listen to this. You will be sons of the Most High. Very important. We we bring all the theology we've been talking about. He's not saying that if you give in this one-sided way, that's what makes you a son of God. In the ultimate theological sense, he's saying, look, that's when you will show yourself to be a son. You'll be a son in the sense that you'll be like your father if you give in a one-sided way. Because your father, he sends his reign and his son on the just and the unjust every day. He gives his food to the ungrateful and the evil every day. He gives joy and gladness and the common grace of life to the ungrateful and the evil every day. There is no comparison to the kind of one-sided kindness that God is constantly displaying day after day after day. God gives getting nothing in return. He said, if you want to look like your father, do that. Not too long ago, I was mowing my yard when the grass was still growing. It's not growing anymore, but when it was growing, uh, I was out mowing my yard, and I was almost done, and my little buddy, Jace, who's two, was out there, and he decided he wanted to do it with me, and he was determined. And so I was ready to pack everything up, but I thought, okay, this is kind of a moment. Uh, I don't want to miss this moment. So I got, he has a little plastic uh, bubble-making mower, and so I lined that up next to me, and I had my mower, and we just went back and forth up and down the yard for a few times. And he's pushing his little thing, and I'm pushing the big thing, and it was just great. He was like, he's doing what he wants to do. He wants to be like his daddy. He wants to do it with his daddy, and he wants to be like his daddy. That's the motivation that Jesus is giving us. As children, we should want to be like our Heavenly Father. And what our Heavenly Father is like is constantly giving in one-sided relationships. He's not looking for relationships that are two-sided. They seem like they'll benefit me, so I'll give to them. He's giving to those who give nothing back to him. Now, now, brothers and sisters, this should turn our way of thinking about difficult relationships upside down, shouldn't it? We tend to think about difficult relationships, either segments of a person that are difficult, like that thing we really don't like about our spouse or our child or our parent. We tend to think of those as the thing to be endured grudgingly, necessarily, or that person that we really don't like talking to. Because every time they talk, they talk about themselves. And the last time they asked you a question about your life was never. And your aunt, who always wants to talk about her strange religious beliefs and could care less what you think about the Bible. And your neighbor, who is furious at you for your Christmas decorations, but constantly blows his leaves into your yard. 
How do we think about those relationships? Now, normally we think eye roll, it's just a part of life in the fallen world. What Jesus is saying is, that is your opportunity. Don't blow it. Your father is at work, loving in one-sided ways every day. He's doing that work every day. If you want to come alongside him and get at that work with him and like him, like that little boy that looks up with a big smile on his face because I'm getting to do it with daddy, seize the difficult relationship because nothing is demonstrated when you love those who love you back. But childlike imitation of a father is demonstrated when you love those who do not love you back. It changes this from a burden to an opportunity because like Jesus, we want to be like our heavenly father. We see in him this glorious, gracious, sacrificial, one-sided love and it delights the soul of every Christian because we are the recipients of it. And we love that about him, that he goes to that work in his own unique, unrepeatable way, and that we've benefited from it because when we were not loving him, he was loving us. When we were not seeking him, he was seeking us. We were not thinking about him even regularly in our everyday life. We're not thinking about him. He is thinking of us and caring for us and pouring out his kindness on us. And every child of God purchased by Jesus and united to Christ looks up at that father and says, I want to do that too. And praise God, I have this incredibly difficult person in my life because if it was just nice people, there's no way I could look like my father. Brothers and sisters, we need to change our perspective when there is difficult people in our life, ungrateful people, ornery people, demanding people, selfish people, people that wouldn't appreciate how hard it is to serve them if you wrote it for them and put it on their forehead. Those kinds of people that look at your effort to serve and find everything that's wrong with it. And it seems like the harder you work to serve them, the more they're aware of how you fall short of their expectations. Have you ever had that experience? You're trying to serve somebody, and the very thing you do to serve is just gives them fodder for more criticism? Now normally, in a normal earthbound way of thinking, that is exhausting. Jesus says it should be exhilarating. There should be something in our heart that says, yes, I found somebody. I found somebody that is incredibly annoying. I found somebody that is constantly criticizing me when I try to do them good. Yes, I found a person who does not know how to drive and they happen to be right in front of me. Yes, this is a moment. Now this is a moment I can look like my father. Because that's what he does with me every day. Does it change your perspective? Jesus is always doing that. Just change your perspective. Upside down kingdom. Heaven coming to earth. Seeing annoying, difficult people as an opportunity to be that little boy out there. I just want to be like you, daddy. We do this with affection and a grateful eye on our father. The whole point of it is there won't be a return. This is so important for marriages. How many times in in marriages is it the case that you, you have some area of your life that you think is just not returned? This is not returned. He, she, not even aware. I'm doing this. How many years I've been doing this? Totally unaware. And we tend to think, unfair. This, this is the, the log I can, I can finally pull out and really beat them over the head when they try to bring a criticism. Well, are you aware of all that I've been doing all these years? 
This is my safety net. When I really blow it, I can point out all these ways that they blow it. And Jesus is saying, no, that's, that's the way a fallen, natural person thinks. A heavenly child of God thinks, I- I'm so glad there are still things that I experience a one-sidedness in my various relationships. Because it's only there that I can look like my heavenly father. Finally, finally, it is measured, this grace that we're to give others, it is measured, listen to this, by what we hope to receive. It is measured by what we hope to receive. You see that paragraph down there in verse 37? Jesus is just moving forward in this series of shocking statements. He says in 37, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Now that is an extremely uncomfortable scripture, isn't it? It is so uncomfortable. But we have to let it speak in the way that it speaks. We can't let it say more than it says. It doesn't say God bases his forgiveness of you on him knowing that you are a forgiving person. This is your righteousness. You can give it to God when you get to heaven, and he will give you admittance. Praise God, because none of us fulfilled this passage. We wouldn't get in anyway. So it's not saying this is meritorious forgiveness, but it is saying this is necessary revelation of the grace of God transforming a person's heart. Necessary, divinely necessary. Jesus is essentially saying, look, if if you want to have a a human way, a human measurement of knowing the kind of grace that a person can expect to receive when they get to heaven, look at the kind of grace they give to others. Now behind the human measurement is the God who gives us grace that we do not deserve and saves us exclusively by the righteousness of Jesus. But Jesus is basically giving us a clue about, humanly speaking, what does it look like when a person will receive gracious, kind, generous mercy from God? Well, that kind of person lives in their ordinary life with a gracious, generous, kind, willing to forgive, not eager to judge disposition towards others. Because like in God's world produces like. And so the grace of God that is shockingly forgiving produces a shockingly forgiving kind of Christian. Now, just a quick caveat, this is not saying, obviously, that we're to be sort of uh, blind to the nature of sin. That's not the point of this. Judge not as in, I don't even know what sin is. I, I mean, you're, you're killing that person right now? I don't even know. I don't judge you. I don't judge you. I can't even see that. I'm, I'm morally colorblind. I, I don't see any sin. No, he's not saying that at all. The, the, the point here is not God doesn't see sin and we can't call sin what it is. The point is, in our personal response to a person, we are not to look for ways to punish them or to make them feel the effect of their sin. Jonathan Edwards helps us in this. He he talks about in a great book, Charity and Its Fruits, he talks about what this might look like when you have the responsibility of bringing correction or observation to a sinner who is in danger because of their sin towards you or towards someone else. He says there, there may be a responsibility that we have to speak the truth to someone. So how do you obey, judge not in that moment? Because the world takes this first judge not to mean don't tell anybody anything about sin. That is not the way the Bible speaks. But Jonathan Edwards gives us an example. Here's what he says. He, the Christian, may perhaps reprove his neighbor. This may clearly be his duty. But if he does, it will be without impoliteness and without that severity that can tend only to exasperate. And though it may be with strength of reason and argument and with plain and decided expostulation, it will still be Without angry reflection or contemptuous language, he may show a disapprobation of what he has done, but it will not be with an appearance of high resentment, but as reproving the offender for sin against God, rather than as for the offense against himself. Married couples, I would strongly recommend you study that sentence. 
Do you bring observations to your spouse primarily because of the offense against you or because of your grief over their offense against God and your desire to help them? May it not be with an appearance of high resentment, but as reproving the offender for a sin against God rather than as for the offense against himself, as lamenting his calamity more than resenting his injury, as seeking his good, not his hurt, and as one that more desires to deliver the defender out of the error into which he has fallen than to be even with him for the injury done to himself. Now, there's a sentence you could put over your heart in the middle of a conversation with somebody. Am I looking to be even with them to the injury done myself and using God language and biblical categories to get something done in them that's really about me? Doesn't mean we never bring observation to another person. Doesn't mean the church doesn't call sin, sin and refuse to allow someone to live in an unrepentant, sinful lifestyle in the name of not judging. It means that our personal disposition is as a fellow sinner desiring to show the shocking grace we have received. It means when we come alongside a sinner who is clearly in unrepentant sin, we do so mournfully and eagerly and humbly and, and, and graciously appealing to them to return to the Lord not arrogantly and proudfully and offended at their sin as though ultimately we are their judge, which we are not. Here is the warning. Those who habitually judge and condemn others are not those who have been transformed by the grace of God. You, you simply can't read this passage any other way. Those who habitually Habitually judge and condemn others are not those who have been transformed by the grace of God. Let every genuine Christian take warning and run away from any tendency towards that lifestyle. God's grace does produce a gracious disposition towards others. Not perfectly and gradually over the course of our Christian life, yes. And are there moments where we see the kind of self-righteous judgment that he's condemning here? Definitely. But should there be this growing pattern of shocking grace, of not looking at others as though they are before my bench and I am declaring them guilty, but rather coming alongside them with grace and mercy? What this should do for all of us is to bring a sobering and painful conviction to any areas where we are prone to a critical self-righteousness or a, a punishing spirit toward others. If we are truly saved, we should see through the Spirit the contrast between the grace we have received and any kind of judgmental arrogance that we display towards others. That should convict us and it should motivate us to want to see in our life the kind of grace we expect to receive when we face God in the end. That's the desire Jesus is planting in our hearts through this passage. You should want to see in your life the same measure of grace that you hope to see in the end because of your belief in Jesus. Now, your forgiveness will not be the basis of his forgiveness on that day, praise the Lord, but you should want to see the same kind of measurement. And ultimately, because of God's providence and his spirit at work in us, it will be. As his spirit changes us from judgmental to gracious, from arrogant to humble, then in our lives we will begin to see the kind of measure of grace, measureless generosity, forgiving 99 times over that all of us hope and trust we will see when we face our God and Father on that final day. And he's saying, look, be glad the measure you use, don't be discouraged. When you measure this painful, sacrificial mercy to this person who continues to injure you, be glad because you're going to experience a measureless grace towards you. It's going to pour down over you and pour onto your lap. Don't be discouraged as you're trying to give this sacrificial, generous grace to someone. Don't be discouraged because in the end, that's the kind of grace that the Father will certainly give to you. And on that day, your receipt of that kind of grace will make all the moments that you gave grace to others pale in comparison. 
And you'll be so grateful that you've been called into a kingdom where grace is the measure of God's response to our sin rather than judgment. John, in writing his first letter, makes it clear why this has to be the case. Why it has to be the case that those who do not expect to be judged must not judge. 1 John 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Listen to this. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. <laughs> you gotta love the Apostle John. He just, there it is. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. And in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I think there's some logic there that says you can't see God physically, but you can see his love in the way the church treats one another. We must not lessen this warning. It's intended to be a guardrail for us as Christians. Saved by the grace of God and transformed by that grace as well. The lifestyle of unforgiveness and judgment will show itself ultimately to have no saving knowledge of Christ. And God will not forgive those who consistently do not forgive because they have not known the salvation that comes from being forgiven by Jesus Christ. If they did, they would gradually gradually, but definitely, begin to show that same grace towards others. Here's the questions for us. Think of the person that has sinned against you. Maybe in a deeply grievous way, maybe in the little painful chirping of sin that always seems to wake you up out of your otherwise comfortable life. Have you treated them as you hope the Lord will treat you? Is our current treatment of them an accurate picture of how we think and trust that God will treat us on that final day? Is my treatment of them an honoring and accurate picture of my Father and my Savior? Here's the glorious call of this passage because any Christian I know that reads this passage feels undone by the standard that it gives to us. It forces us to know our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior better. It forces us because you cannot do this based merely on looking at yourself in the mirror every day. You can only do this by gazing endlessly at his perfect display of this passage in the gospel until the joy of seeing that in display towards you begin to flow out of you towards your wife and your children and your siblings and your parents and your neighbor and your coworkers and the guy on the road that's still going 27. Only by looking at our saving God do we begin to experience the joy of doing this for others so that it's not just a burden for us. It's a delight to reflect him. Philip Ryken says, We will never learn how to love by working it up from our own hearts, but only by having more of Jesus in our lives. We will never learn how to love. Don't try. Don't, 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 don't go home and just think, I'm going to be more loving this week, more gracious. Begin by gazing at Jesus Christ, the one who loved his enemies, who did good to those who hated him, who blessed those who cursed him, who indeed turned more than just his other cheek to those who struck him, who gave what he could not receive back in return, who chose not to judge, but instead to forgive. Look at that God who died for us in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, on the tree, 
Look at that God and allow that gaze to transform our hearts and to overflow out of us in gratefulness expressed in same shocking grace to other people. Look at Jesus. As he took his humiliating experience of a human nature so that he could represent us. Look as he pours out his strength for disciples that he knows will desert him in his darkest hour. Look at Jesus as he pours water on the feet of Judas. Knowing he would betray him to death. Look at Jesus in that scene on the beach as he calls Peter to his side on a gentle walk and invites him to reaffirm his love for him after Peter denies him three times. Look at Jesus as he tells the thief who is just then mocking him that he will be with him that day in paradise. Look at Jesus as he prays for his crucifiers that his father would forgive them for they know not what they do. Look at Jesus most importantly as he declares before his last breath that our atonement was finished in full, that he had paid for all of our unforgiveness and our petty self-righteousness and our desire to punish through our silence or our speech those who do not deserve anything from us because we are not their God and look at Jesus dying for that self-righteousness and carrying it away from God the Father and instead covering us with his record of kind, merciful, gracious patience so that we go before his Father. He sees the love of Jesus covering over us as our reputation with God. Look at that Savior and meditate until you marvel and marvel until you worship and worship until you are looking for people that you can display that same kind of love to. When Dirk Willem bent down and lifted up that soldier, I'm sure he was hoping at some level that that act would be enough to convince the townspeople to let him go. It's my common decency. I'm sure he was hoping that. But what motivated his decision was that what was most important to him was looking like his savior. The one who died to save him when he was an enemy. And those townspeople might have mocked his choice as foolish, naive. You're a sucker. But when he crossed over the river, as D.A. Carson said about his own dad, all the trumpets sounded. First, because he was saved by the death of Jesus Christ. And second, because that same kind of love was shown towards an enemy which led to his own death. And that glory is worth any sacrifice because we look a little bit like the Savior that saved us. Let's go into this week looking at Jesus and thanking him for saving us and looking for opportunities to look a little bit like him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to pray especially, Lord, for marriage relationships right now. I pray, Lord, that oh, Lord, all of us that are married would apply this passage and the next conversation, the next conflict, those memories that are present from some historical offense. And I pray especially, Lord, for any marriages that have experienced of late a, a level of conflict and difficulty where it was very challenging to love in this way. And I pray, Lord, you would fill their hearts with visions of your shocking grace. Lord, I pray for those who have been mistreated 
by this world, whether at work or in some relationship, I pray, Lord, for those that have suffered at the hands of others, Lord, that your love for them would fill their hearts with joy. Lord, that your steadfast patience and gentleness towards them would replace the pain and the hurt of the sins of others. And that, Lord, where appropriate and possible, they would be able to love their enemies and to do good to those who have cursed them. And I pray, Lord, for our church. Lord, that we would gaze so steadfastly at you and your dying sacrificial love for us that it would be our joy to look for moments to look up at you smiling and reflecting in our own childlike way what you are like. Cause us to be centered and filled with the joy of your grace. We confess it as a church. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone for the glory of God alone. We rejoice in it, in Jesus' name, amen.